Edwin, how are you? Hey, not too bad. Yourself? You know, it's uh, <laughs> it's it's getting on. We've been having a a good day here. I mean, that was a fantastic demo session. I don't know how much you got to watch. I, I think only came in the last ten minutes because it's it's actually five a.m. in the morning right here. It's pretty yeah. Early. <laughs> yeah, that's um, I realized that. So thank you so much for getting up at four thirty. Um, <laughs> But uh, that was a remarkable session because it shows how easy it is to exploit a system. That's that's what that was remarkable about. Um, uh, Edwin is a friend of ours that I have met numerous times. He uh, is one of the lead developers, uh, runs the team at Tyro Payments in Australia. He speaks for us in Singapore at the RSA conference. Well, uh, DJ and I got to come and see your development team last year too while we were on Australia, Edwin. Yeah, I remember that. That was that was really good. Everyone really enjoyed DJ's talk. Actually, they they walked away going, "Wow, that is pretty amazing what uh, what, what they're doing up there." That's great. That's great. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll be in the background here. Uh, if you need any help, I'll jump in. Okay, sounds good. Um, so um, I'm really glad to be here talking today. And for this talk, I like to share how we extended Soundtype um, IQ Server or Lifecycle to integrate with our development process here at Tyro. There are two main things I like to talk about, and uh, they are security self-serve and automated time-based waivers. So I know I got about 25 minutes or, or 30 minutes for this talk, so I'm going to go through some of the stuff really quickly. So I'll be talking for initially about who Tyro is, what we do. Um, I, I'm guessing that if you're not, you, you're not in Australia, you probably haven't heard of Tyro. So I'll just go through a brief overview about them. And then I'll talk about our Nexus lifecycle journey, um, what we actually did when we first started using a product and, and what we actually do with the information that we had from there. And then I'll move on to the two things that we did to actually extend the functionality in lifecycle. And, and, that, and those are automated time-based waivers and security self-serve. And I'll finish off by some of the challenges that we actually have with this implementation and some of the benefits too. So um, let's get started. So about Tyro. So Tyro is an Australian financial institution, um, and we specialize in merchant credit and debit acquiring. We're based in Sydney, and we provide Australian small to medium enterprises with innovative product and services to help improve and grow their businesses. The company was founded back in 2003, and today we have over 400 staff and over 20,000 customers. So that's just very quickly about Tyro. It's also worth talking about the engineering department. And the engineering department consists of around 150 engineers. Um, the, the, the department consists of about seven tribes, with each tribe having between two to four teams. There are a total of 20 delivery teams in there. And the tribes are focused around a specific product, such as digital, payments, banking. Um, and all the teams are cross-functional with each tribe having a solution architect in there and at least one quality advocate. So also at Tyro, we develop all applications using a microservices architecture. This is very important when, when we talk about the, uh, the IQ server lifecycle scans. Um, and today at Tyro, we have around, uh, we have over 200 microservices running in production. And we also do continuous integration. And this is where we favor pushing small incremental commits to the master repository. Um, we initially did a fortnightly deploy of all our changes into production, but today we have a number of different deploy options. And let me share them with you. So we were able to bring the fortnightly deploy down to a weekly deploy. This means that on deploy day, we will take the latest release version of our application and deploy them into production. We were also able to further simplify the deploy process for a number of applications to do what we refer to as security self-serve, oh, I mean, sorry, deploy self-serve. <coughs> this is essentially an automated on-demand deploy. The development team can click a button and have the latest versions of their application deployed to production. The last deploy option we have available is continuous deploy. The deploy is automated and is done by the build pipeline. We currently do continuous deploy for applications that reside in the cloud. 
So yeah, that's a, just a brief intro into our engineering practices. Now let's talk about our Nexus lifecycle journey. So this journey started at around the same time as our application security journey. That was back in 2015 uh, when we were working towards getting a banking license. We did what most people would do when they first started using uh, Nexus Lifecycle. So we've, we've installed the uh, Lifecycle and then we ran it for the very first time against all of our applications. This was the results from that. So this scan was done back in September 6, 2015. And as you can see, we found 80 critical security issues. This is all just security stuff, 405 high and 112 medium. We didn't have any low in there because we were so overwhelmed by the number of critical and high that we did not want to know. So we then started a journey on how do we address the security issues that we had discovered. So the first thing that we did was to put Lifecycle into our pipeline and we configure it to break the build on security issues. Well, we really have some existing security issues so we grandfathered the existing CVEs um, that would prevent any new components with existing vulnerabilities to be introduced. Back when, This was back in 2015. There was no such thing as grandfathering as a feature back then. So the way we did that was we actually modified the policies themselves to include the components and the CVEs um, to actually exclude them. The next thing that we did was we address the CVEs based on priority, starting with the critical ones, working our way down. We did that by creating Jira issues for the components with the outstanding CVEs, and we gave them to the teams. We say, hey, can you please fix this particular CVEs on this component? Once they've done that, we gave them a new set. So we kind of drip feed the number of issues to fix slowly to the team. It was a pretty long journey. It took took around two years to actually get it down, um, but we did eventually bring the number down to, to a healthy number where we are today. And I believe it was only in October 2016 that we start really looking at the medium issues. So it actually took quite a while to actually deal with the critical and high before we got down to the rest. One of the challenges we face while addressing the CVEs were that new CVs kept popping up. We weren't allowing components with existing CVs to be added to the applications. <clears throat> so this was CVs discovered in existing components. This, these new issues weren't grandfathered. So the moment they were discovered, they would cause the, the build to break. Now, nobody likes a broken build. So this was a big headache for us. When that happened, we had to add a manual waiver we then have to speak to the teams explaining what happened and that the latest broken build isn't really an issue, or well, not just yet, and that they have X days to fix it before the waiver is, is removed. This happens quite regularly, some months more than others. And I would say that on average, we had around one new CV each month. So that's how let's talk about automated time-based waivers um, and how that came about. But before I actually dive into how we do automated time-based waivers, I'd like to share how we got there. Um, we didn't look at doing automated time-based waivers from the beginning. We we're trying to solve a different issue. And that issue is that the IQ server or lifecycle scans took too long. So on this screenshot down here, it's actually the results of one of our, of, of a, of a, of a build and test one of our microservices. So the total time that took was 21 seconds to build. The one below is the same application, but this time with a lifecycle IQ server scan done in there. So you can see the difference. It added an extra 55 seconds. And you know, normally this is not a problem. It's a pretty, it, it, it seems pretty reasonable to, to scan through all your components, but for our microservices, that was a four times increase in build time. And the developers did not like that. We, we, have, uh, we do test 
uh, TDD, test driven development. So they're constantly building the microservices. And this was um, a source of frustration for a lot of developers. So we decided to address that. So um, the approach that we took was we created a custom Maven plugin. Um, and obviously, this is all for Java. And what the plugin does was this, this replaced the, the, the Sonotypes uh, IQ server plugin that they provided. It actually it scans the POM for any changes. It only triggers a scan if there are changes being made. And the way we did this was we actually ran the command, the uh, Maven dependency tree. And we would store the output of that into a, a text file and have that be committed into the repository. So the next time you do a scan, it would run a dependency tree and it would compare the outputs to see if it's changed. This is only for the local build. It's not for the pipeline build. The 55 seconds for the pipeline, that's, that's not prone. Um, but it does make the assumption that the components listed in the, whatever has been committed are free of security issues. Um, so this solution was fairly effective. It actually brought the build time right down. So we only scan when there were changes and um, everyone was fairly happy with that. It did not address though the scenario when a shared component is being upgraded. So we use shared components to standardize certain functionality among applications. This include how we connect and authenticate to a database, and also how we do authentication and authorization for inter-system communication. So when you update a shared component, you obviously update um, an application to use the, the new version of a shared component. When you do that, it does the, the, the IQ server scan, you get an extra 55 seconds, that's reasonable enough. But normally, when a shared component gets updated, you have to update a number of applications as well. And that additional 55 second scan is being done on every single application that you are updating. And um, we got a lot of complaints again. So, so we decided to look at how this security scan has been done. And, and what we noticed was when you, you do a build on your local machine, it does a call to the lifecycle server that you have installed. And that in turn make a call to the Sonotype service. So this is the uh, clm.sonotype.com service. And we discovered that the bulk of the time is actually spent waiting for a response from the Sonotype service. We spoke to Sonotype about this and something about partial matching that they're trying to do in there. Um, and, and that makes sense. And we also realized that, that it takes around that time on average. It doesn't matter if it's a brand new component or you're scanning something for the 20th time. It would always take around that time to get back. So we decided to improve on our initial design by this time adding a caching service. So the caching service uh, has a database and, and keeps a list of components that it knows are good and bad. And it would only forward a scan request um, if the component is unknown. And it also updates its, its good component list periodically to make sure that it's up to date. So this, this is how it looks. It's an, it's an additional service. Our, um, the, the plugin now calls the new service, which then calls our lifecycle installation and which we call the, the Sonotype type service. The benefit of this is, is that if everything that um, that's in the components all the components that the application is using is known, then you get a very quick response for that. So, <clears throat> so the results of that, we had faster scan results most of the time. Uh, that was really good. And we also helped to prevent the introduction of components with known security issues. It does not help with security issues that are discovered in previously good components. Um, because it, it's essentially a caching service. Um, and those are particularly problematic for a few reasons, such as the unexpected. They don't happen as a direct result of a recent change. Teams will come to me and say, hey, we updated 
this particular version, but it's flagging for something else. We didn't make anything, we didn't change anything in there. Um, so it's quite confusing for them. And we, we feel that they tend to be discovered at the worst possible time. Um, and that's when we decide to introduce automated time-based waivers. So what it does is, it does not fail the build when a CV is discovered. And once again, this is on existing components. We don't allow brand new components with issues to begin with. So this is just for CVs discovered on existing stuff. So instead of failing it, we provide a grace period, or we call it an SLA, from discovery to when we fail the build. And that's based on the, um, the policy ratings. So this is what we have for our grace period. So if the security issue is a critical one, we would break the build straight away because our SLA is you should fix it straight away. If it's a high, we give them two weeks. And the reason for two weeks is um, back, uh, back a few years ago, we were working in fortnightly iterations. And we felt that two weeks was a good enough grace period because the, the security issue might be discovered in between iterations and you might not have uh, planned or, or any bandwidth to do that work. So you could always plan it for the next iteration. Uh, for medium and low, we just pick those numbers out of the air because they seem like a reasonable amount of time. So <clears throat> now let's talk about how we actually did the automated time-based waivers. We actually use the, uh, the webhook service uh, that Lifecycle provides. So, and we we'll, and, and this is done do, you, um, during the continuous monitoring scans. So the scans that just happen periodically, and I think they happen once a day, every morning at, at midnight. Uh, so during the continuous monitoring scans, um, if a security issue is discovered, um, the web hook call is made to our location service. Uh, we do some stuff in there. And the result of that is we actually apply a policy waiver to Lifecycle. So that way it would not break uh, the build. And we obviously we store those waiver details uh, at our caching service. So that's kind of how that works. Um, and we also have a daily scheduled task to review all the waivers that are existing. And if the, the waiver is past the SLA, um, we remove the policy waiver. And we also get the functionality uh, to allow teams to set custom SLAs uh, just so long as it's lower than the company's SLA. Um, actually, a few teams actually took that up. So that's, that's pretty good to hear. One of the really important things about having automated time-based waivers for it to be effective is you need to provide notification. You need to let teams know that, hey, this has been discovered, but we're not breaking a build just yet. We're giving you some time to address it. Um, and we, they need to be kept up to date as to uh, how long these waivers are gonna last before it becomes a problem for them. So there are a few ways we do that. The first one is, is through the emails notification. So we kind of set emails to be sent out uh, for continuous monitoring results. Mm -hmm. So you they get an email telling them, hey, you got a, like in this case, a security medium issue. Um, we also created a, a dashboard. Every development delivery team has uh, one or two monitors uh, around their pod. And on those monitors, they display information that they care about, such as uh, I guess, health checks or the results of the builds. And we created a, a dashboard for uh, a countdown for the, the security issues. So on the dashboard, it actually has the name of the application on there and in brackets, the number of days before they start failing. In this particular screenshot, you can see that the first two ones have 13 days before they actually become an issue and they start breaking a build. The next two at the bottom, were low security issues. And when that screenshot was taken, we weren't addressing low security issues at that time. So that's, that's why there's no, um, no SLAs on them. The next way uh, we did this notification is through Confluence. So we had a, a scheduled job where we would update and create a, or create a new Confluence page. <clears throat> and on that page, we actually show a table showing um, the components and the application which have this waiver and how many days there are left. And as you can see in there, um, 
there are two in there with one one has 20 days before uh, it becomes an issue and one has one month and 12 days uh, in there and the last way we provide feedback is direct feedback from the maven plugin so when they're doing the builds if there's a waiver in there this is what they see they would they would tell them that the build successful but right above that there's a warning saying that in this case Hypernet Validator version 535 final has a, a medium security issue and you've got 25 days before this actually breaks your build. And when it does break your build, this is what you see. So it, sh it shows you the build failure and in rate it tells you that the version um, is causing a medium security. So now we've done that, let's talk about security self-serve and how, how that works. So what security self serve is, it actually is a, a mechanism to allow teams to apply for an extension for those security waivers um, or for any security issues whose waivers have expired. And by doing that, they actually give themselves more time to fix issues and it allows builds to pass again. So why do we do that? <clears throat> the main reason for doing that is it's usually business priorities. Uh, where we're trying to, I guess, go to market early with certain functionality, and we just need a little bit more time to address security issues. Sometimes the fix for those security issues uh, require quite a bit of changes to be made, and teams require more time. So that's another reason why they would want to um, apply for an extension. And the last one is there might be no fix for um, this, there might be no fixed version for that component. We normally entertain this normally for really low stuff. So there might be, hey, you've got a particular component um, that has a security issue. <clears throat> Reading the uh, information in, in the CV, you don't think it's affecting our system or um, it's very low risk and it's not worth moving or, or doing some workarounds or switching that component out to something else. So the best is to wait for um, a new version to be released by the maintainers that has this, the issues fixed and it hasn't been done yet. So that's another reason why. So to do security self-serve, you actually need two logins to perform the, uh, uh, the extension. So this is more for, I guess, accountability and, and just to audit just who's doing that. And you also need to provide a reason. So when the teams do that, the, the conference page that I was showing you guys earlier that showed the uh, applications with the issues and how many days there is left. Uh, there is an extra column on the right hand side, which would up, uh, which would indicate who were the people that requested a waiver and what was the reason that they uh, needed an extension for. And it's a command line tool. If you run it, um, it shows you the list of um, issues that are currently waived or have no waivers on there and you could uh, select which one you want and you enter a reason for why you want to have an extension and then it's done um, so it's a it's a pretty simple service um, and we initially thought that people might be trying to abuse this service but we have not seen this and we had this this self-serve waiver in there for around two years now and yeah it's been it's been really useful so now for the last bit, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that we face from um, this two, I guess, enhancements that we did to Nexus IQ. So the first one is everything that we've done only works with Java uh, and with the Maven palm.xml. Uh, it's, it's okay because that is so far the, the main language that we're using. Um, in the last year, we started using more languages and we're starting to see that, hey, we need to do something else to accommodate those particular languages. <clears throat> the other challenge that we have is we're obviously playing with unsupported Nexus lifecycle APIs. Uh, that is particularly with the, uh, the calls to make the, uh, to apply the policy waivers and to remove them. This, um, this means that we have to be careful when we upgrade our version of Nexus Lifecycle just to make sure we read the release notes and we test it correctly to make sure we haven't broken any of this functionality that we've added. And um, another challenge that we have is uh, syncing issues between a source of truth and our service. So we obviously have a caching service and uh, sometimes there might be some issues in there 
Um, and, and more often when we do have issues, it's an issue of our location service says that it's good, um, but Lifecycle says that there's an issue. And that's because it just, it's, it's just we just need a bit more time before things again. And the last issue that we have is dealing with accidental upgrades to minor versions that still have the CVE. So we obviously do not allow any components to be introduced with uh, existing vulnerabilities. And, and the problem we're talking about here is, let's say we use the example of Hibernate Valid. Uh, that's okay. You've got about uh, two minutes left to time out. Uh, were you headed towards a conclusion? I am heading towards a conclusion. Oh, okay. So I didn't plan that. Um, yeah, didn't plan that. Uh, so just in, in conclusion, I'll just say that, hey, um, the enhancement that we did is not perfect because it's limited to Java, which is our predominant language, um, but it has been working really well with the engineering teams. Developers love this, I guess, and, and the main reason why they love this is because they are now in control of the security issues. Um, security you know, are, are something that are unplanned, but they can manage it um, within their, I guess, their, the way they work. So they really like that. And they can obviously address issues uh, based on the, the risk appetite for, uh, the, based on the company's risk appetite. So I might just finish that right there. And thank you very much. Cool, I think you're mute, I can't hear you. Yes, I'm sitting here talking and I'm on mute. That's typical. <laughs> um, I was telling Tim he can come in if he wanted to ask you a question, if you he heard something. But one of the things that's interesting to me, and I heard it from DJ Schleen last year when we uh, when we met you in Singapore too, is that most people that start and see this say, if we have a vulnerability, we have to break the build right now and fix it. But the, the, the newer way to do it, and the way most companies are starting to handle it is, you set a priority level to say, is this something that we can fix uh, uh, downstream and not stop the process right now? And that sounds like what you're doing with uh, your automated uh, time-based waiver. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And the, the main thing, I guess, is it's empowering developers. Now, security is not something that's just popping up and breaking a build and you have to address it straight away. You can now manage it. You, you, we, what we're doing is we're saying that, hey, there is a security issue. We have discovered something. The, the next product has picked up a few new CDEs um, and it's important, but we're not gonna break or stop whatever features you're doing right now to address it. You have to address it, plan to address it probably in the next few iterations. And that's what makes a huge difference because it's, I guess it's planned. It's not something that's interrupting them and interrupting the flow. Yeah, I like that. I actually uh, did some screen caps uh, of your slides when those went by. I thought that was very important. So, Gray, always good to talk to you. If you would, please go to the Slack channel and the general channel and upload your slide deck and say hi to everybody, answer any questions that they might have. Will do. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Really enjoyed doing this. And I will see you on June 15th in Singapore. See you then. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Bye.